once upon a time, in the early days of the automobile, the most dependable form of horsepower wasn't always under the hood. piston pushes, air, fuel, and ignition worked when they felt like it and sometimes just went along for the ride. Engineers have now built them new and better engines. Research is constantly striving to make more energetic workers of them. What this will bring in the future, we do not know, except that we will have more efficient engines and better transportation. Even now we have engines of many sorts and for many purposes. Yet for all the variety of engine types, our friends, air, fuel, and ignition, are still doing business with the fundamental principles of power developed in the first single cylinder engine. The heart of an engine, whether it is a V-type or in line, is still a cylinder closed at one end, enclosing a piston that hides in the cylinder, attached by a connecting rod to a crankshaft that is connected to a flywheel. Three piston pushers, air, fuel, and ignition do their jobs. Any modern automotive engine, no matter how intricate, operates on the basic four-stroke cycle. Intake of fuel and air. Compression. Power. And finally, exhaust or elimination of burned gases. This continuing cycle, intake, compression, power, and exhaust, is what makes our automobile go. Today, of course, we have engines with many cylinders. Four, six, eight, or even more. But fundamentally, they operate on this basic four-stroke cycle. Let's see how these principles of power are used in a six-cylinder automotive engine. First, let's consider the crankshaft in an actual engine. The crankshaft has a counterweight opposite each crank to assist in making the engine run more smoothly. These main bearings are inserted between the crankshaft and the members of the crankcase which support it. The connecting rod bearings join the connecting rods to the crankshaft. The pistons are fastened to the other end of the connecting rods by piston pins, often called wrist pins. The cylinders themselves are mirror smooth holes in a metal casting called a cylinder block. The lower part of the block and the oil pan which is fastened to the bottom make up the crankcase. With a gasket in between to guarantee a gas tight fit, the cylinder head is bolted tightly to the top of the cylinder block. Now let's look inside the cylinder block and see how the four-stroke cycle operates in the engine. You will recall the cycle starts with intake of air and fuel. The piston comes up and squeezes air and fuel into a small space. This is compression. A spark ignites the squeezed mixture 
pushing the piston down. This is power. The burned gases escape. This is exhaust. Naturally, the piston must fit very snugly against the walls of the cylinder, whether cold or hot, to give us full power. If our two friends could break out of jail, our compression chamber, and don't think they wouldn't like to, we would lose part of the thrust against our piston. We would lose compression, meaning simply, we would lose power. And there's where piston rings have a job to do. The tiny space around the piston is sealed by these springy rings, fitting in grooves around the piston and pressing tightly against the cylinder wall. These rings prevent loss of power and help to control cylinder wall lubrication. Of course, air, fuel, and ignition must reach the cylinders at just the right time and in the right amounts. You have seen that air and fuel enter the cylinders together, actually as a mixture. And that's where the carburetor comes in. The carburetor combines air and fuel in exactly the right explosive mixture. Fuel enters the carburetor at the float chamber, which is sort of a storeroom with a float to keep the fuel at the proper level. Air is sucked in through an air cleaner. The racing pistons pull it at the speed of a full gale past a tiny opening called a fuel jet, which is the right size to mix the proper proportions of fuel to air. One part of fuel to about 15 parts of air by weight. The rush of air past this tiny opening sucks fuel out into the air stream and breaks up the liquid drops into an explosive mist. This mixture is fed to all the cylinders through a pipe called the intake manifold. When the engine is running, the mixture flows into the intake manifold continuously. But we want it in each cylinder only on its particular intake stroke. To accomplish this, there are two openings at the top of each cylinder fitted with valves that are opened and closed from above. During the intake stroke, the intake valve is open. On the compression stroke, both valves are closed tight. Ignition starts the mixture burning, which gives us our power stroke. In the exhaust phase, the burned gases must escape in some way. This is taken care of by opening the other valve in the top of the cylinder called the exhaust valve. The burned up gases from all the cylinders leave through a pipe called the exhaust manifold. It now becomes apparent that the valves must open and close on a split second timing arrangement to make the cycle work. The mechanism to accomplish this starts with the camshaft. This is a shaft driven by the crankshaft at one half the crankshaft speed. On the camshaft are cams or bumps, sort of ovals with one side higher than the other. There's one below each valve. Remember we said the valve must open at exactly the right time? Well, the high point on the cam comes around at exactly the right time 
and pushes upward on this rod, which in turn causes a rocker arm to push the valve down and open. When the high point of the cam passes by, releasing its pressure, this spring returns the valve to its normal position, which is closed, sealing the cylinder tight. In a six-cylinder engine, there are 12 valves, 12 rocker arms and push rods, 12 cans, six of these for intake, six for exhaust. The camshaft is connected to the crankshaft in exactly the right way by timing gears so that as the engine runs, the valves open at exactly the right time. Now we're ready for the third member of our piston pushing trio. Ignition. The electricity, as it comes from the battery, hasn't nearly enough force to jump across this gap and make a spark. So our little friend travels first to the coil. Here, with the help of the breaker and other electrical devices, little Mr. Ignition is transformed from junior size to big time stuff. Thousands of volts, raring to go, and waiting only for directions. The traffic cop that sends him along the right highway is the distributor. The distributor is simply a revolving switch, directing each spark impulse to the right spark plug at exactly the right instant. And as we know, the right instant is when the piston is almost at the top of its compression stroke and our mixture of fuel and air is squeezed to a small volume. Mr. Ignition is big league now. He touches off the mixture of fuel and air, and we have the tremendous power of internal combustion. Explosions mean power, but they also mean heat. Internal combustion power is heat. But not all of this heat goes into useful work. Some of it just heats up the engine and must be carried away. And so our engine must have a cooling system. We know the water we put in our radiator has something to do with it, but where does it go from there? The cool water from the radiator is circulated by the water pump through chambers in the cylinder block. This water jacket removes the heat around the combustion chamber, but in so doing, the water itself gets hot and must be cooled. The pump forces it from the hot cylinder walls back to the radiator to be cooled by the air circulating around the small passages which make up the radiator. The fan which spins just behind your radiator helps pull in the outside air for cooling purposes. Once cooled, the water is ready to go through the system doing its job over and over again. Another cause of heat is friction. But if we keep oil between two rubbing surfaces, the friction is very small. So, just as our engine needed a cooling system, it must have a lubrication system. Lubrication not only reduces heat, but makes it easier for the engine parts to move. The reservoir for this system is the crankcase. Some of the engine parts need oil under pressure. So, this oil pump 
forces oil to such parts as the main bearings, the connecting rod bearings, the piston pins, and the rocker arm shaft. But not all parts are oiled by pressure. The piston and cylinder walls receive lubrication by oil sprayed from bearings and other moving parts. We now have a complete automobile engine of the overhead valve type. The other common type is the L-head engine in which the valves are arranged upside down and off to one side of the cylinder. The L-head and overhead valve engines are the types commonly used in automobiles. Whatever the type of engine, the elements that keep it running are always our friends, air, fuel, and ignition.